My JBL Bar 9.1 review is my most viewed single system video to date. Thank you very much. So, this will be an unapologetic Get Show Snacks Emperor Helping Stella Find Her Groove Sweater Weather review of the So Fresh, So Faced JBL Bar 1300X. Hey, what's up everybody? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. What we have before us is a $1,700 11.1.4 channel 1170 watt soundbar system which sits alongside the Samsung Q990B as co-general in the soundbar system channel count arms race. At the time of this recording anyway. The 1300X perches atop JBL's spec energized next gen soundbar lineup. Just how energized is the new lineup? Well, if you've been considering the JBL Bar 9.1, which is the flagship from JBL's previous generation, just considering channel count and not all the other technologies and enhancements I'll be discussing, the 9.1 falls below the 2022 lineup's second tier bar, the JBL Bar 1000, and just slightly above the third tier, JBL Bar 700. So if the 9.1 is the caliber bar you are seeking, you might wanna check out those options, which are significantly cheaper than... The rumors, they're true. I sass talked the 9.1 pretty hard in my 2020 review. Though just a young buck in his late 30s with 14 subscribers rounding up, I did sense the 9.1 was getting more accolades than it deserved. As fun as the sub was, its sonic presence, core sound, richness just didn't belong in the same discussion as other flagships, in particular the Samsung Q900 series. Fast forwarding three years or a thousand years in soundbar time, the 1300X on paper at least does seem to be a good faith effort to put this product in the Q900 stratosphere. And could it be that JBL was just clever enough to put it over the top? I don't know. Anyway, I'm gonna give a detailed and commentary riddled overview of the hardware and technologies crammed into this thing. And by the end, I want to answer as best I can whether this product performs closer to the JBL Bar 9.1 or the Q990B. And I'll tell you where I rank this system and cinema performance amongst the crowd favorites. So let's break the ice with a good ol' all the stuff you get when you push the complete order button. Well, one thing for sure, a big Oklahoma box. Inside you'll find a mystery box including mount kits for both the bar and surrounds, two power cords, an HDMI cable, and yes, you're adding another remote to the family. My remote family is rather large, but I know how to push all their buttons. You get a sound bar that immediately puts a knot in your stomach because you think for the price, it should be a lot heavier and wider and taller. These freewheelers are magnetic bar end caps, so they're actually pretty clinging. Next, the so-called detachable surrounds, but I think it makes a lot more sense to call them attachable surrounds because being attached to the sound bar is the weird thing for surrounds to do not being detached, which is what all other soundbars have done since the beginning of soundbar time. Anyway, they are wireless and have a built-in battery, so you can be experimental in their placement. The magnetic connection is robust. I should have predicted that. And last, it's not Klipsch Cinema 1200 huge, but for an all-in-one box sub, it's a big boy. So you know, how much space did your lady give you for your little soundbar project? Okay, now that we found everything, let's talk setup. Plug in the bar, turn on the attachables using the power button in the back, worry about placement when calibrating the system. Plug in the sub, put batteries in the remote. If you've been using optical cables to connect your TV to your audio equipment, you are now presented with a wonderful opportunity to step out of the home theater dark ages and connect this bar and TV via an HDMI cable using the ARC port on your TV and the eARC port on the bar. Just trust me for now, we'll discuss the numerous benefits later. Your TV should automatically recognize and begin routing sound through the bar. Also, when you adjust volume using the TV remote, the bar volume should change, which you can confirm on the display. If you're not getting sound from the bar, make sure you plug HDMI cables and ARC ports in both the bar and TV. If that's not the issue, Go to your TV sound settings and change the output to HDMI ARC. If that doesn't work, get ready for an all-consuming warlike effort to fix it. Just being honest. I'm not your mom. If you want to use the many different wireless playback options, or you would like to control the bar with your phone, 
update the bar over the air as opposed to a USB stick, well, you'll need to connect it to the internet. To get this bar connected, you'll need to download the JBL1 app. Now, in general, it's not uncommon for this process to go catastrophically wrong. Sound bars in the internet? Not the closest of best buddies. Luckily, my experience was easy breezy, lemon squeezy. At the end of the setup, I was prompted to update the bar and calibrate to the room. You probably wanna do those things. The update takes about eight to 10 minutes, so plan ahead. Sometimes as we get older and more busy, as unromantic as it seems, we just have to put calibration time on the calendar. My advice on surround placement is put them on the appropriate side, try to get them behind you and with decent separation. Design and build the bar. It's plastic, but not the worst plastic. Plastic you can bring home to your family. There's a grill spanning the front and grills on top. There's a somewhat unique and completely unnecessary plastic on plastic panel on top of the bar that holds the pinhole room calibration mics and three old fashioned up and down buttons. Your kids will get a kick out of them. The ports are in the back and completely accessible, which is very out of fashion. For sound bars these days, it's de rigueur to play hard to get when it comes to ports. But when you've got as many sound bars as I have, there's just no time for silly games. You know what I'm saying. Now it all gets a little weird on the ends because they're docking stations on a sound bar. But perhaps the most cautionary aspect of this bar is its size and weight. While it does a lot of flagship type stuff, which I'll cover, it doesn't do flagship physicality. So it's a little squatty, quite narrow, and light at under 10 pounds. These qualities are associated, at the very least, with a narrow soundstage and a lower quality mid and low frequency response. Yes, this bar is heftier than its predecessor, but that little voice is telling you, not by enough. The surrounds, same build as the sound bar. There are grills all over the place, except the back and the love connection side. They look like a lot of things other than surround speakers, though it's a clever way to make wireless surrounds with this convenient and aesthetically pleasing charging solution. The important question here is not if wireless speakers are cool or not cool, you can decide that, but whether the extra charging convenience is worth the kind of restraints put on the surround's dimensions. I do wonder how much better these might be if they were allowed to be taller than two inches and unconstricted by the bar dimensions. Moving on, in the back, you have mounting holes, a USB charging port for charging while detached from the bar, and three buttons that I'll cover later. The sub-module. The build materials are completely ordinary, built with medium density fiberboard or MDF, encoded in a hard, not sure what it is, but protects from scratches. Credit where it's due, JBL has engaged in some hardcore science to bring us the most hopeless of bleak gray. And to then lather it on this featureless monolithic structure, I mean, the unwavering dedication to the banal is staggering. Anyway, on five of the six sides, there are precisely two design elements. On the top, a light JBL branding, and in the back, a sync light button, which turns white when connected and audio is playing. Then you turn it upside down and discover this 12 inch woofer that is four inches wider than the Q990B sub module and two inches wider than all the other JBL soundbar woofers, including the more plain JBL bar 1300. The four legs, while lacking some of that appeal you might normally find on a four legged supermodel, are quite sturdy and have very comfortable and practical shoes. The driver array. The 1300X is an 11.1.4 channel system, meaning there are 11 discrete audio groups dedicated to projecting audio horizontally, so parallel to the floor. One low frequency channel, yes, you with the soft stubby legs, and four channels shooting up and bouncing off the ceiling to mimic ceiling speakers. The soundbar alone is a 7.0.2 speaker with a center, left, right, surround left and right, wide angle left and right, yes, believe it or not, they buried a tweeter in there and you said it was impossible. The height left and right channels are unique in that each channel has two woofers angled differently to diffuse the height effect. 
to intensify that sensation of being attacked from above by delightfully bouncing sound off your ceiling. Until the Nakamichi Dragon is released, which also has four upward firing drivers on the soundbar, the 1300X will continue to adorn the most upward firing drivers on a soundbar system ribbon. Oh, like your ribbons are so great. The surrounds. My compulsive instinct wants to call it a 2.0.1 speaker because that's what it needs to be for everything to add up to 11.1.4, but the driver positioning looks a lot more like a heavily fortified 1.0.1 speaker. JBL documentation is not clear how the channel count breaks down between bar and surrounds. Anyway, on this side of the surrounds, you have a woofer and tweeter, making it either a single or dual channel. A mystery I won't solve before the end of this review. And on top, a full range woofer taking care of the height channel. Another atypical aspect of these attachables, besides their shared evolutionary history with Panini's, are the inclusion of passive radiators. Yes, two of them, top and bottom, where zero is the norm, which should give these speakers a relatively satisfying low-end presence. Let's talk audio codec support. The three formats a system needs to support to avoid nasty comments are Dolby, DTS, and LPCM. For Dolby and DTS support, you want two things. First, support for their respective lossless versions of Dolby True HD and DTS HD Master Audio, which gets you a fuller sound with a higher dynamic range than the lossy tiers like Dolby Digital 5.1. Second, the system shall support 3D audio versions of Dolby and DTS, which are Atmos and DTS-X respectively. With 3D audio, fancy software in real time directs whatever speakers are available to virtualize sound objects suspended or moving in space, like rain, the whiz of a gun bullet, and the everyday common asteroid flying over your head. As opposed to a traditional surround channel mix that pre-assigns sounds to a specific speaker. While 3D mixes sound best from lossless audio, typically read from a Blu-ray, you can stream a less data-rich Dolby variant that still supports Atmos called Dolby Digital Plus, which is what pretty much all the major streamers use, so Netflix, Apple TV, Prime Video. And LPCM, what's up with that? This is a lossless format that gaming consoles and Apple TV uses. Without support for LPCM, the audio mixes are converted to stereo, where they're probably meant to be 5.1. Keep in mind LPCM can be decoded to Dolby and Atmos, but you need full LPCM support to support that conversion. Didn't want you to think that Apple TV doesn't support Dolby Atmos, which of course it does. Oh, and yes, this system supports everything I just talked about, so you're good. Sound technology. The JBL execs want you to know that the 3D effects are dealt with using Harman's multi-beam technology, which angles the drivers to more effectively bounce off walls and bolsters bouncy sound with specialized digital signal processing. Pure Voice also gets a special shout out. This is not a voice enhancement setting, rather an ever-present technology that aims to make dialogue ever clear. So hopefully it's an effect you like. The display, it's located on the right side of the bar. It's very straightforward, scrolly, as you would expect. It's most useful in providing information bits like codec type and audio level. The display does turn off after a few moments of inactivity, so there is no brightness or always on setting. And I found it much easier to read from across the room than some of the other products I've reviewed recently, namely the HGA9 and the Q990B, which is a bigger deal than you might think as small character displays lowers confidence and testosterone. The ports clearly presented here, though for the newbies, I'll add some soundbar port 101 commentary. EARC, the queen bee of ports. It's short for Enhanced Audio Return Channel, which is one of those acronyms where reading it out doesn't really do anything for comprehension. So what this port does is both receive audio from the TV and pass a long video to the TV if you plug, let's say, a PS5 into the bar using one of these three HDMI inputs. The E in EARC, in practical terms, means that the port can receive lossless audio from the TV, so those include the lossless formats we discussed in the previous section. Now let's keep in mind the E on the EARC port here is only useful if your TV also has EARC. 
If you bought your TV before 2020, it very likely doesn't. Pretty sad, I imagine. Well, I mean, all my TVs are updated to eARC, so I don't really know what you're going through. Uh, I literally have to use my imagination to relate, so. Yikes. Anyway, so those three inputs on the bar I talked about 22 seconds ago? Yeah, so if your TV is defunct because it's over three years old, you can use these three HDMI inputs as a way to get lossless audio direct to the bar, bypassing your TV. This is one reason why these inputs are desirable, particularly in this ARC to eARC transitional period. These inputs are not peak performers, however, only supporting 4K 60 Hertz. Psst. All the young people want 4K 120 Hertz to support their Nintendos and whatnot. Dolby Vision and HDR10 are also supported. In case you didn't know, three HDMI inputs is quite generous, being one more than typical amongst flagships. So you can support a gaming console, Blu-ray player, and Apple TV at the same time. So about that optical option, it exists as an eARC so-called alternative, but keep in mind it does not support 3D audio nor lossless formats, except a stereo mix, and it renders your inputs useless. Other downsides include itching and swelling. The USB port is for music playback if you buy the X or if you are purchasing in the Asian Pacific region. Otherwise, it's just for updates. And last, we have Ethernet, if you were responsible enough to plan for that. Wireless playback, a better than average offering by a decent margin. So you have all your regular criminals, Bluetooth, AirPlay 2, Chromecast, Amazon Alexa with multi-room music support, and Spotify Connect. Three of these support multi-room playback. So I'll talk about this more when I overview the app, but you also get Sonos-esque like music streaming. What this means is that streaming services can stream direct to the bar as opposed to streaming first to your phone and then to the bar. This kind of integration is beneficial because it gives you access to a higher res stream than AirPlay, Bluetooth, and Chromecast, though I don't think that applies here. But far more importantly, it frees your phone audio so you can while the music continues to play. Controllers, you have four sets, the bar and surround buttons, the remote, and the app. First, the bar controls, volume up, down, and a source toggle. The surrounds, power, Bluetooth mode, and bar mode. The power button doesn't turn any of the other components on or off. The Bluetooth button, a medium press will do if you wanna set a single attachable to pairing mode. For the Bluetooth sophisticates that want a stereo pair, you have to hold the Bluetooth button on both speakers for an uncomfortably long time until you hear this tone. Just a quick sound review, um, impressive for the portable types, uh, the passive radiators are appreciated as it gives the speakers a nice foundation. It's definitely a nice gadget to throw outside while air frying and entertaining friends. And as there is a Bluetooth mode, this button here sets it back to business mode where it stealthily transforms back into a surround speaker. Did you catch it? The remote, it's narrow, kind of mediocre in feel, sporting that weaponized gray tone. Other than that, you have a remote here that wants to do basic useful things with single or repeated presses. So source selection, volume levels for main, rear, space, and height, play pause for music, this heart button here that I'll riff on in a bit, and quick access to calibration. The app, it's not all that complicated, so I can kind of run through it. In the speaker tab down here, we have first a virtualized version of the remote, which is a strange thing to do as the app should be designed to be a better reimagined remote. A little uninspired, but not without its uses. A three band equalizer, so bass, mid, and treble. Bass here is adjustable on the remote. And here we have a moment creator. It's so weird. This allows you to choose one track, one, not one playlist, not one album, one track, and choose how loud you want it to play and how long you want it to play. The heart button on the remote plays your one track moment.
My only explanation is that an executive was stuck at home with a kid, constantly asking him to play a song over and over again. And the moment feature makes that terrible situation just slightly better. I am not aware of a stranger soundbar feature. Okay, moving on, a rear speaker volume adjustment, which affects both the horizontal and height channels. Here is where you want to calibrate the system at least your first time because you're given critical instructions on how to execute the process, which unfortunately involves moving the attachables to different locations, requiring a certain level of commitment, especially if you're over 40, comfortable, and have already started snacking. I haven't experienced any issues with the dreaded lip sound mismatch, but if it rears its ugly head, there's your adjustment mechanism. In the Music tab, you can set up all those integrated streaming services I discussed, where you can browse specific services and you can do things like create playlists and set up favorite artists and albums and whatever. It all works perfectly fine, though I do wish you could use that heart button on the remote to capture a song you like and throw it in favorites. The Settings tab, it's where you set up Alexa. The Sound. Overall, I found the sound profile to be well-balanced. Unlike the 9.1, it seems they put forth some effort to give the sound a solid core. They're trying to do more than just tickle and shake you with overheated tweeters and a solid bass module. On the opening scene of Blade Runner 2049, an inspired soundtrack for sure, this bar delivers with deep menacing rumbles, swelling symphonics, and those quivering sustained electronic notes. You can hear those dollars working. Want to start off feeling good about this bar? Buy that Blu-ray and make that the first thing you listen to. Sound effects are crisp and the dialogue clarity, credit where it's due, impressive. The lower mids give the sound a satisfying thickness and realism, in particular when a grunting grizzly bear is chewing on Leo's head. The wireless surrounds sound profile is similar to the bar, though I think they can actually punch a little lower with the assistance from the passive radiators. They can be very present at times, unleashing a surprising amount of energy, even while being squatty. Who knew? The bass module performance is very good, much like the 9.1. It gave my favorite dramatic moments those legit cinematic undertones that makes you feel as though you were justified to once again skip the movie theater. One of the many moments that impressed me with the bass module here was rapid gunfire and let's say two thirds of the scenes in any one of the Transformers movies. Those are actually pretty good movies if your goal is to hear a lot of Atmosy stuff. Anyway, it was able to keep up with perhaps a eight hertz firing rate with precision. Contour, deep attack, release. Deep attack, release. Rinse and repeat. I don't think it's trivial to get a sub module to do this, especially ones with 12 inch rims. So I was pleasantly surprised that the increased size didn't steamroll that ninja spirit that so delighted me with the 9.1. In terms of the Atmos performance, I'm gonna start with some apologetics. I think one misconception about an Atmos track is that every sound is supposed to have 3D qualities. I don't have the super expensive hardware to visualize the mix, but a lot of what you're listening to, even if it's an Atmos track, are sounds assigned to a specific speaker, a static mix. So when you're not getting that everything Atmos experience all the time, well, maybe the track is not meant to be that anyway. Now, given this, some bars are perhaps truer to Dolby's intent than others, meaning they might lather on more proprietary tech to give a soundtrack a more consistent 3D presence. I'm not sure how much special multi-beam sauce is being put on top of Atmos or DTSX, but it doesn't sound as extreme as the likes of perhaps Sennheiser with their Ambio effect and Sony with the 3D spatial sound mapping technology. In any case, sound whooshes, explosions, gunshot flares, electronic pulsing engines rushing overhead. If it's moving, it sounds believable and gives you the kind of thrill I can easily endorse. While the intense yet brief moments typically underline with sound burst or orchestral crescendos feel all encompassing, in the quieter moments, I sense to a minor degree, the soundstage would shrink, attenuate a bit more than I'd prefer. The complex intimidating space I was enjoying became narrower, less differentiated, soundbar centric, perhaps a little too center channel-y. 
For the most part, even in more intimate dialogue scenes, I still want a generous dose of atmospherics, separated in space, making the world I've taken an interest to feel consistently big and full of energy. And don't get me wrong, you get those characteristics with this bar. I'm being really picky. Though, and I suspect this was a purposeful stylistic choice, I sensed JBL overly de-emphasized the tactility of the background soundscape in favor of a more focused forefront, primarily serving dialogue. Compared to the Q990B, the sound was just a bit more constrained, consolidated, monaural, particularly in the front. The sense of breadth and separation that the Q990B fosters, I think, masterfully for a soundbar, wasn't manifesting at the same high level here. This result should not be all that surprising because the bar is less than the Q990B in every physical dimension. The channels are much closer to each other and perhaps more susceptible to crosstalk, and the bar has less volume, which would lead to a more restricted airflow. I think the lack of size and heft of the X makes living up to the Q990B when it's performing its best very difficult. This might be good or bad depending on your taste, but that live carbonated fizzy edge on the Q990B, which is controversial, is less pronounced on the 1300X, which perhaps lends to a more natural delivery, but also, as I mentioned, perhaps a less textured atmosphere, particularly in the quieter moments. You're probably wondering about this, but I didn't find that the extra woofers on top of the bar led to an obviously superior height effects performance. The high performance was obviously impressive, but not obviously better than the Q990B or HTA9. In terms of volume, the X can get plenty loud, but nowhere near as loud as the Q990B. I could play it at full volume, and while perhaps that's not the smartest thing to do for hours at a time, it never got excruciatingly loud, even with lossless formats that generally sound more intimidating, again, due to an extended dynamic range. With the Q990B, I don't think anyone's ever made it to full volume and lived to talk about it. Which actually could contribute to a weakness of the Q990B over the JBL Bar 1300X. In that, and thanks to Supreme Kizzle for bringing this up and making me think about it a little bit, I'm willing to bet that you'll have to adjust the volume less with the 1300X to stay in your volume and dialogue intelligibility comfort zone in part due to greater emphasis on dialogue, which may be a good or bad thing based on taste, and I suppose its inability to get as crazy loud, which should result in less masking of dialogue. With music, it's largely the same story. This system can get that booty butt moving from side to side. The bass module does make sure of that. But as I mentioned, the front channels are a bit crowded, compromising the sound's ease, openness, and detail that is characteristic of traditional stereo setups. Though I will admit, the surrounds, if you can give them some separation, ease these limitations to a significant degree. I'll admit I could probably benefit from more listening time, but there were a few tracks I listened to via HDMI and very surprisingly, the vocal sounded a little recessed, a strikingly different delivery than I was accustomed to listening to many of the same tracks over and over again. This effect did not seem present, however, when music was streamed wirelessly. Perhaps a little ding in the armor to look out for in other reviews. Putting this all in context, I have had soundbar systems that just put me in a bad mood. This is definitely not one of them. I enjoyed numerous moments with this bar. It was just not quite as awe-inspiring as the Q990B, nor as paradigm-shifting as the HTA9, which is the system I choose to use when not in reviewer mode. Because I'm nice, if I had to order the top systems, those that include bar, bass, and rears, for best all-around cinema performance, last to first, it would go like this. The Bose Soundbar 900, the Sonos Arc, the Klipsch Cinema 1200, the JBL Bar 1300X, the Sony HTA9, and still top dog, the Samsung Q990B. Though I think it is possible both Ambios could rank highest, if they could find some really good rear speakers. Closing thoughts. There's a lot of good stuff going on here. Quality feature offerings, three HDMI inputs, all the wireless playback compatibility, arguably the best all-in-one box soundbar kit sub, flexible battery-powered surrounds, and I'd say not peak, 
but a quality sound experience both in profile and 3D audio performance. Unfortunately, I think it's really hard to recommend this product for the cost when the Q990B can be acquired for far less money. But I do think scenarios exist where this might be the better system. If you have a smaller listening space, limited room around your TV, no outlets to plug in the rears permanently, you want a nice Bluetooth stereo pair for the bedroom, patio, deck, backyard, good bass gets you hot and bothered in the best way, you want to do some hardcore music streaming, or if you really like the 9.1. All right, this went way too long, just like I planned. I do have this 20,000 sub goal by 2024. It is a lame goal, so don't let me fail. Anyway, thanks for watching. Wrapping this up, catch you on the next one.